Mm, good morning, everyone. Um, so we are down to our last two weeks of the semester. Um, we'll continue with where we left off last week. It, would someone open us in prayer before we start? Father God, we thank you. We bless you for this day, Lord. Father, you are great and you are awesome, Lord. We worship you and we thank you. Father, we, as we are uh, going through this um, pursuit of revival, Father, help us to know that the key is praying and praying according to your word. And Father, help us to do this, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. Uh, so we stopped off. Um, we just gone into chapter 8. Uh, we'll continue from there. We'll be looking at a lot of scripture passages today, so if y'all can be ready to read. Um, we'll do that. So we read uh, last week at the end of the class, we read Isaiah 60 to 1 to 7, so we won't go back and read it now. Uh, but we'll just discuss a few things that we see from Isaiah's example um, based on this passage. Uh, so uh, in Isaiah 60, um, he talks about uh, God's glory being seen over the people. So that was a little bit earlier in uh, the book of Isaiah. And then in 62 is when he is uh, saying that these uh, he's calling the people back. He's uh, talking about how they will be restored. Uh, but there's also, um, he knows that destruction is coming, right? He knows that they're going to go into exile, that the Babylonians are going to come and destroy uh, Jerusalem. Even though he knows that he is still talking about uh, this future glory and restoration that is going to be there, and he doesn't stop uh, with just that destruction. He prays for and he intercedes for that restoration that will happen after after the destruction. Uh, so that is something for us, even if we know judgment is coming, uh, to also know that God God's heart is always to restore. And so we can be praying for restoration in the church, even if there is... Uh, there are things that are going wrong in the church, things that are needing to be addressed or things where we know that there is action that's, that needs to be taken. We can also be praying with the hope of restoration, uh, praying with the hope of revival. There's never a time when we should give up hope or say, okay, there's no way God can work in this situation or in this church. Uh, that should never be our attitude. And so uh, looking at these verses, uh, there are a few things that we can take away from Isaiah's example. So we looked at how uh, Jerusalem and Zion in the Old Testament are a picture of the New Testament church. So when he is praying, he's praying for Zion's sake, for Jerusalem's sake, for the restoration of uh, of Zion. And so that should be something that we adopt, we pray for, uh, with the same kind of passion, with that uh, burden to see the church become and be all that it's meant to be, right? So when he's praying, uh, there is a vision of this is what God called the people of God to be like. He called uh, Zion to be a city on a hill that is a light for the rest of the world, where nations will gather, they will come to know who the true God is. So having that vision of what is the church called to be and to have the burden to see the church in that place, fulfilling what we are called to be. Um, so we look at a few verses, Matthew 16, 18 and 19, and Amos 6, 1. Matthew 16, 18, and 19. Chapter 16, 18, and 19. Uh, 
and i tell you that you are peter and on this rock i will build my church and the gates of hades hades will not overcome it i will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven thank you and um emma 61 emmaus chapter 6 verse 1 woe to you who are complacent in zion and to you who feel secure on mount samaria you notable you notable men of the foremost nation to whom the people of israel come so uh, we see on matthew 16 18 verse 19 um, picture of what the church is called to be right uh, uh, a place against which uh, the gates of hades will not prevail so we are uh, advancing god's kingdom we are overthrowing the kingdom of satan we are uh, we are bringing god's will uh, for his people for the world to earth by the things that we are doing the way we uh, live our lives the way we carry out our day to day lives uh, the things that we are called to in our everyday lives how are we bringing god's kingdom in those places so that's what the church is called to be and uh, in amos 61 we see this other group of people who are uh, at ease right they are resting relaxing they are very complacent about uh zion they're not thinking about zion being all that god has called it to be so we can be this one group of people who are complacent who are very satisfied with the way things are or we can be on the other side with that matthew 16 vision of the church uh praying towards the church fulfilling that calling um and uh, so like isaiah to be people with that burden who are crying out on behalf of the church uh, so as a few other things he says he says i will not keep quiet i will not rest until so uh, to have that kind of attitude where we will keep pursuing god we will keep interceding for the church uh, until god's glory comes as he has promised right uh, to have that um, fervor that passion that zeal um, and that faith that god is a god who will fulfill his promises and then the last part he he uh, calls watchmen to not be quiet so he says watchmen don't keep quiet do not keep silent give god no rest right uh, so to say to he's raising up other people to share in this uh, burden that he has so he has a burden to intercede for uh, for jerusalem and then he is calling other people who are placed as watchmen uh, who are placed there to guard the city uh, against attacks to keep the people safe to also have this attitude of praying calling out to god not resting uh, and asking god to fulfill what he has promised uh, so for us to also be people who stir others up so not only do we pray not only do we intercede but we also raise up others who will pray with us who will have that same kind of passion for the church um so from there we go into what are some heart conditions for praying for revival now if most of you have worked on the assignment you'll have already read through all of this so uh we anyway we're going to just mostly be reading passages of scripture uh but we look at in this part what are some attitudes of a heart that we should have in order to see revival happen and uh revival we're looking at as starting with us as individuals right if we want to see revival happen in the church it needs to first begin with us for us to be people and instruments through whom god comes and uh so what should our 
part attitude be uh, in order to see the Bible happen for ourselves. Um, so to pursue intimacy with God, uh, to allow God to continuously be changing us into his likeness uh, and to allow God to create in us a clean heart, a heart that is ready uh, for that role as an intercessor, uh, as someone who's asking God to come. Um, we read this quote from Charles Finney. It says, Revival is the coming of the inexpressibly sweet and tender spirit of God into the midst of his people with convicting and transforming power. The outpouring of God's spirit is the divine aspect of revival, while the preparation of the heart is our part. So um, that's what we're going to be looking at. How do we prepare our hearts uh, for revival? So first is a heart that is humble. Uh, we'll just look at these different passages. Second Chronicles 7.14. Yes, 7.14. Second Chronicles 7 verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So we see that uh, for God to hear, for God to forgive, for God to heal, we first need a heart that is humble, right? A heart that comes to God with recognition of our sin, where we are praying and seeking God. Uh, and so uh, not only to have a posture of humility, uh, but also then to turn away from wickedness. So uh, to live, to see that uh, change of heart reflected in the way we live. Uh, and then we will see God come, God pour himself out. Um, can we read Hosea 10, 12? Hosea 10, 12. Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. So um, break up your fallow ground. Fallow ground is ground that was being used to cultivate crops, but now is, in, is not being used. It's been abandoned. It's been left uncultivated. Uh, so God is uh, calling them to once again sow righteousness. So to break up that ground that has hardened, uh, that is unproductive, uh, and to get it ready for a season of sowing and reaping. Um, and we sow righteousness and we experience God's mercy. So reap in mercy. Uh, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. So uh, that is, uh, there we see both the what we're called to do and the promise. We're called to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on us. Um, and these are the promises that we can be holding on to as we are praying uh, for God to come, as we are preparing ourselves uh, to be praying these promises, these words that God himself has given us. Um, Hosea 14, 1 to 7. Uh, o Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity, receive us graciously, for we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. Asriya shall not save us. We will not ride our horses, nor will we say any more to the work of our hands. You are our God, you are our gods, for in you the fatherless finds mercy. It will heal their backsliding. It I will love them um, freely, for my anger has turned away from him. 
I will be like the dew of dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily and le lengthen his roots like Lebanon. His branches shall spread. His beauty shall be like an olive tree and his fragrance like Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall be renewed like uh, grains and grow like a vine. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Thank you. So uh, we see uh, in Hosea, uh, the verses 1 to 3 of chapter 14, where um, he's calling Israel to turn back from all things in which they have put their hope. Wherever they have uh, sought help from other people, other things, rather than God, He's saying, put away all those things. And then verses 4 to 7 is a promise from God that he will restore them, that he will bring them back to himself, uh, that he will bless them, uh, revive them, make them fruitful, and release his glory on them. So it's from that place of coming to a place of complete dependence on God that then God blesses, God pours out himself on his people. Um, so we'll just read John 15, 1 to 5. John 15, 1 to 5. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine raiser. Every one branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that we as fruit, he prunes, that it may be a more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Avoid in me and I in you, as the branch cannot be a fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So thank you. Yeah. So that is the heart of humility, where you recognize that apart from God, I can do nothing. Uh, and it is that place of completely depending, completely relying, uh, completely abiding in God, because you know that any fruitfulness, anything that is going to happen will only happen if you are in that place of communion with God. Uh, so that is uh, that is the picture of humility, where you are completely surrendered, completely dependent on God, recognizing Him as the source for any fruit that your ministry or you are going to bear. Um, we'll go into the next point, a heart that is hungry. Um, we can read the verses from there, Matthew 5, 6. Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. So uh, this is God's promise, right? When we come to him with a heart that is hungry, when we come with a heart that's thirsty, then we will be filled. Uh, so to have that kind of hunger, uh, that desire for more of God, uh, that recognition that we are empty and we need to be filled, uh, that is a heart that we should be coming to God with. Uh, Psalm 63, 1 and 2, read that. Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. So again, um, that hunger and thirst for God, right? So a soul that is thirsty. Uh, 
that longing for God that uh, actually feels like your flesh itself, your body itself is desiring, is needing more of God. Uh, so it moves from just a spiritual uh, sense to a physical, like, uh, pursuing or physical sense of hunger and desire for more of God uh, to the extent that he goes to the sanctuary. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your glory. So he goes pursuing God's presence uh, wherever God is, he wants to be. Uh, so that is a kind of a spiritual hunger and thirst that moves us to physical action, uh, to physical pursuit of God. Uh, Psalm 27.4. Read that. One thing I have desired of the Lord that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Yeah, so I think David is uh, like the Psalms are this perfect example of someone who is really seeking after the Lord. Uh, so to be a man after God's heart uh, is kind of described in these words, wanting to know God, wanting to experience God, wanting to have that intimacy with God. Uh, so one thing I have desired is the Lord himself, right? that I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. So what do I desire is God himself the presence of the Lord, uh, to be in his presence, to behold his beauty, uh, to receive wisdom from him. So all of those things are uh, the same heart of Mary as well, right? To uh, Mary was doing the one right thing, the best thing, uh, is to be in communion with God. So having that kind of uh, passion that's driving a pursuit of God, having that kind of heart. Um, Hosea 6, 1 to 3. Read that. Hosea 6, 1 to 3. Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge, acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. So in Hosea, we see this promise, right? Let's return to the Lord. Um, we see God's judgment. We see uh, that we are in a place that is not a place of blessing. That is not a place of prosperity. So let's go back to God and we can be sure that when we go back to God, we will see his blessing come on us. As sure as we are of the rain coming, we can be sure of his presence, his blessings coming back on us. Uh, and so to have that kind of confidence, right? When we uh, are seeking the Lord to be sure that he will answer that he will pour out his blessings on us. Uh, we look at one more, Isaiah 44.3, which has a similar promise. 44.3. For I will pour water on him thirsty and flood on the dry ground. I'll pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. And John 7.36-39. John 7, 36 to 39. John 7, 36 to 39. Okay. <clears throat> what is this things that he said? You will seek me and not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. On the last day and great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. 
what this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive for the holy spirit was not yet given because jesus was not yet glorified so we see here uh, um the promise of the holy spirit to those who come to jesus right so if you are thirsty come and drink um so having that hunger thirst going to jesus to be satisfied and then becoming springs through which the holy spirit is poured out on others right through which we are meeting the needs of others ministering to others uh so that is the kind of heart we need to have if we want to see the bible happen in ourselves um a heart that is passionate and persistent so i can read james 5:16 to 18 Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective fervent prayer for a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnest, earnestly that it would ra not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. and we can look at uh, first kings chapter 18 there are a few different verses uh, from that chapter read verse 1 and, and 41 and then uh, no then 16 to 21 first kings 18 verse 1 And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, "Go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth." Verse sixteen to twenty-one. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, "Said to him, Is that you, O trouble of Israel?" And he answered, "I have not troubled Israel." But you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the four hundred and fifty prophets of Baal and the four hundred prophets of Asherah who eat at Jez Jezreel's table. Verse thirty-nine to forty-six, and it came to pass. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, "Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again." Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now, when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, "The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God." And Elijah said to them, "Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape." So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook, brook of Kishon, and executed them there. So. Forty-six, verse forty-one. Then Elijah said to Ahab, "Go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain." So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top top of Carmel. Then he bowed down to the ground and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, "Go up now, look toward the sea." So he went up and looked and said, "There is nothing." And seven times he said, "Go again." Then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, "There is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea." So he said, "Go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you." Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to to the entrance of Jezreel. So we see here in James five, he's talking about this incident in Elijah's life, uh, right? And so he's saying, 
Uh, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Uh, that is a prayer that is passionate, a prayer that will persist, a prayer that uh, will continue uh, to pursue God for God's will to be done. Um, and so he first prayed that there would not be rain and there was no rain for three years uh, and six months. And then he prayed again. Um, and this time, uh, this time there was rain. Uh, but what happened before he prayed? He had to believe that God was going to do what he said he would do, right? So uh, God tells him, "Go tell Ahab there will be rain," uh, and then he tells Ahab that he calls all the prophets there. Uh, they have this whole showdown between the. Uh, prophets of Baal, prophets of Asherah, and uh, Elijah on the other side. Um, all of them praying for God to send fire. Nothing happens with the other prophets. And then Elijah says a small prayer and God sends a fire. Um, and so it was because Elijah was already in this place of intimacy with God, already someone who had been praying, already someone who had faith uh, to believe God would do what he said he would do, uh, that God was able to use him to this extent. And then uh, once God's fire comes, there's judgment on the prophets of, uh, of Baal and Asherah. And then he says... I hear the abund uh, I hear the sound of abundance of rain. It hasn't yet come, but having that confidence, God has said He will do this. It will happen, uh, and then He goes to pray. Right? He knows God is sending it. God has promised it, but He still goes to pray for that rain to come. Uh, so that is the kind of prayer we are called to as people who know that God has promised his spirit will be poured out on those who are thirsty, uh, who calls people to repentance so that he can restore, so that he can pour out his blessings on his people, uh, to be people who take those words in faith and who pray them into, uh, into being, right? Who pray until it's fulfilled uh, with faith that God will do it. Uh, we'll also look at, um, I think, Luke 18, 1 to 8, and Genesis 32, 24 to 30. So this is where Jesus teaches about praying persistently. Eighteen. Luke chapter 18 verse 1 to 8 then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up he said in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought and there was a widow in the town who kept coming to him with the plea grant me justice against my adversary for some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, it because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who carry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And Thank then, you. Uh, Genesis 32, 24 to 32. Genesis 32, verse... 24. Genesis 32, verse 24 to 32. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as, as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. 
Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. And the sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because of the socket of Jacob's hip was stretched near the tendon. So both these things are an example of persistent prayer. Right? Jesus says, uh, he teaches that parable to teach us that we should pray and not give up. Uh, and uh, this second example of Jacob, that he wrestled to the extent that he was unwilling to let go of the angel um, until he was blessed, until he received blessing and favor from God. And so uh, if we're looking at it from a physical perspective, there's no way that Jacob would have the physical endurance to fight with an angel. But it is what was happening within him, that desire to be blessed, uh, that pushed him to keep fighting, to keep wrestling until the angel blessed him. Um, and in that fighting, in that wrestling for the blessing to come, his whole life was changed, his destiny was changed, right? From being the deceiver to become someone who had wrestled with God and man and had overcome. Um, and so to become someone who is an overcomer, to become someone who has the favor of God upon him, uh, from being someone who was a deceiver. Uh, so, uh, persistent prayer is something that is taught and uh, asked of us as believers. And so that is something that we should be willing to do, uh, knowing that it will bear fruit. Um, the last is a heart that is compassionate. Uh, we'll look at Isaiah 57.15. Isaiah 57, verse 15. For thus says the High and Lofty One, who inhabits eternity, whose name is Holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and a humble spirit to revive the spirit of humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So... Um, God is saying, I am in the heavens, my presence is in the heavens, but I'm also with people who have a heart of humility, uh, people who uh, have this spirit of repentance and want to see me move. Uh, and so that is the kind of heart to be people who are carrying the burden uh, that that Christ has for the church, right? That same kind of compassion for the lost, uh, that same desire to see the glory of God manifested in the church, uh, to see the church be the bride of Christ, uh, ready for his arrival. Uh, so having that kind of passionate, uh, that kind of um, alignment with God's heart for his people uh, is uh, is needed in order for us to pray in line with God's will. Uh, we look at Galatians 4.19. So we'll just read these verses and then we'll talk about the main things that they talk about. Galatians 4.19 My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until I un until Christ is formed in you. I would like... Only 19? Yeah. Uh, and then Romans 8.26 and 27. Thank <laughs> you. 
Romans 8, 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we out, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts know what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Uh, Hebrews 5, 7. Hebrews 5, 7. Who in the days of his place, when he said, afford, afford up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him, who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear. And then that last verse, Psalm 126, 5 and 6. Those who saw and rejoiced in the kingdom of God, he who continually bearing seed for soul, shall downstairs come and be rejoicing, bringing his. Okay, so uh, we see in Galatians 4.19, Romans 8.26 and 27, this, uh, this kind of sharing in the pain of birthing something, right? So Galatians 4.19 talks about laboring in pain to see Christ formed in the church. Uh, so uh, going through that same pain of a mother who's going to give birth, uh, sharing in that anguish for the sake of what is going to come, to see uh, Christ being glorified in the church, Christ uh, being fully uh, worshipped, being fully uh, seen, evidenced in the way the church, uh, the church lives, the church uh, carries out everything that they're doing. And then Romans 8, 26 and 27 uh, talks about the groaning, right? It talks about the groaning of all creation until uh, the children of God are revealed. So we share in that groaning, in that we feel the pain that uh, is in the world. Uh, and then we allow God through his spirit to give us the words to express that. Uh, and so this... Move, having the heart of God means that we feel that kind of pain. Uh, we feel that uh, burden for the world, for the church, and we uh, cry out with that same pain, that uh, that heart of God for the church, for the world, uh, to see God. And then we see Christ's example talked about in Hebrews 5, 7, uh, that he prayed with that with vehement cries, with tears uh, to his father, right? So we follow that example. And then Psalm 126 as a promise that when we sow in tears, we will reap in joy. Um, that doubtless we will come back rejoicing, bringing the harvest with us. So uh, to look forward to that promise of the eternal harvest that will be us. Uh, we are sowing uh, this time, we are sowing tears, we are sowing uh, our own lives, our own hearts uh, in this temporary world for an eternal harvest. And so that rejoicing will be much, much greater uh, when we see the lives that are touched through what we have sown uh, in this time on earth. Um, so we'll close with that. We'll continue from here tomorrow. Um, anything that you all want to share? Because you all have looked at this uh, chapter for your assignments. Anything that you all want to share from what we discussed today um, that you all thought about as you all were doing your assignments? Has everyone done their assignment? <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Okay, so uh, yeah, I look forward to reading your papers. Uh, and the quiz is posted as well, your final quiz. So you can go ahead and do that whenever you have the time. Okay, thank you. We'll see you tomorrow.